Welcome to Zero Knowledge, a podcast where we talk about the latest in zero knowledge research and the decentralized web. The show is hosted by me, Anna, and me, Frederick. All right, so this week we're sitting down with the guys from Tornado Cash. Tornado Cash is a zero knowledge based mixer. Um, and what we're going to talk about today is what a little bit about mixers, what they're used for, how they work, and then dig into Tornado Cash. So welcome to the show, guys. Hello, welcome. Uh, I'm Roman Storm. I'm a part of a Tornado Cash team. Yeah, uh, I'm Roman Semenov. Uh, I'm more responsible for our like snarky part. And Roman Storm is more responsible for user experience and everything. Cool. We, I think this is the first time we've had two people on with the same name, so we'll have to deal with that throughout the episode. I think what's really funny with you two is it's Roman S and Roman S. Yeah. We can't even differentiate on last name here. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So uh, we have both a, a UI UX representative and a snarky representative. That's good. Uh, we can talk about the full stack of building an application like this. Maybe it would be really great for our audience to get to know you guys a little bit better. So, Roman Storm, why don't we start with you? What's a little bit about your background? Sure. Um, I'm Roman Storm, and uh, I, I work as a software engineer starting in Silicon Valley in San Francisco, working for small companies and big companies. Um, and then, like, I learned about Bitcoin back in 2015. Uh, that's uh, where I, like, built some small applications uh, for Bitcoin chain. Uh, then I met uh, my friend Igor Barinov, where uh, together we built something called POA Network, uh, which is based on a parity protocol uh, from Common Testnet. Uh, we learned quite a lot about DApp development, Solidity, Ethereum, how to scale Solidity, and we did quite a lot of research on that back in 2017 and 18. And after that, I decided to run a, consul a consulting company called PepperSec, and that's where we were focusing on helping other companies to do security audits and the custom DApp development. And we were always focused on making our own products as well, which led us to build Tornado Cash. Interesting. How about you, Roman Semenov? Uh, by education, I come from uh, quantum field theory <laughs> background, but I'm in the space of uh, blockchain for around two years. I started uh, by working on various Plasma implementations like Plasma MVP, Plasma Prime, and stuff like this. And then I got into more into SNARKs and zero knowledge uh, in general and privacy technologies. And after this, started building the Tornado. We haven't really covered mixers on the podcast before. And even though they're like a pretty standard concept, they've been around as long as Bitcoin has been around. Um, it obviously, like their design changes with discoveries in, in cryptography, uh, the sort of primitives of them change. Um, but maybe we we'll cover a little bit of like, what, what is a mixer, first of all? What is its goal? Sure. Uh, there are different types of mixers, so-called. Uh, one of them would be like, depends on which uh, cryptocurrency you're using. For example, Bitcoin. Bitcoin has their own mixers and there are also mixers custodian and non-custodial. So we would be more interesting to talk about uh, non-custodial mixers because they are much more uh, technically uh, complex to implement. So for example, in Bitcoin uh, blockchain, there is a popular technology called CoinJoin and uh, one of the popular wallets would be Wasabi wallet that implement this technology. It's much more different and they don't know, do not use any uh, zero knowledge uh, technology in it. There are also other popular uh, cryptocurrencies such as Monero and Zcash and Monero would use something called ring signatures and Zcash is using ZK snarks. So mm -hmm. Tornado Cash is based on ZK snarks because 
one of our visions is to replicate all the cool privacy preserving features that exist on the Zcash blockchain on Ethereum. Mm -hmm. But is like Monero's privacy, this ring signature, does it act a little bit like a mixer? Like it sort of, how does it hide the actual uh, transfers? Like I, what I understood was it was hiding it much more by like mixing it up with other transfers so that you couldn't necessarily map which one would be an individual's. Yeah, like uh, Monero uses uh, decoys. So basically they have uh, UTXO model. There are outputs and inputs for transactions. And for each transaction, they add fake inputs. So uh, instead of single true input, there are 11 inputs. One of them is real one and 10 others are decoys. And so, yeah, would you call that a mixer type build? Is that like, is that in the same kind of category as a mixer? Um, I, I think like for mixer, the more proper description is like, uh, I imagine mixer as the thing where you put money into and then take it out, like kind of like I bag see. of coins. Some people come along and put coins there and then under new identities or maybe there'll be other people's come and take coins from this bag. So I think Monero is different from... Because it's a full blockchain and a cryptocurrency in itself. I would say it's yeah. different only because um, you're not mixing it up with other people's transactions. You're generating these decoys and then kind of mixing it with those. So in like this microcosm, I would also see it as a mixer, but it's mixing it not with other people's real transactions, but with decoys. Uh, um, decoys are real transactions, like it, it, they are real outputs on the blockchain, but they are not used in the computation. So you, you pick uh, 11, you take SOS, and only one you take SOS is checked against the uh, output that it has enough money. Got it. But the decoys are not like generated. I see. They are real ones. So then. My, I mean, my, my actual question here is like, is it, does a mixer as we define it, is that something that has to sit on top of another blockchain? Not necessarily. Or can it be a blockchain? Cause like, uh, yeah, as we can see from the production versions of mixers, like there is a whole blockchain called Zcash, which also allows you to have the mixing of coins with other participants. And there is a solution that we built, Tornado Cache. It, it's not a it's not a blockchain. It's just a decentralized application that is built on top of Ethereum using Solidity language. Got it. And so uh, this is interesting because I wouldn't necessarily think of Zcash as a mixer or like a mixing structure because it's just using a zero knowledge proof to hide the transaction sort of in plain sight and it's not mixing up transactions with a bunch of other participants but i i suppose like when i think about it and how a mixer would work you could define it that way because there are multiple transactions and they all look the same and you can't really like it in that sense so but how would you say that zcash is a mixer like the the definition probably depends on whether we allow internal transactions to be inside the mixer. Like if we would call the similar structure, but with transactions inside of it allowed the mixer or not. Like if we allow internal transactions that the cash can be called. If, if we don't allow, if we call it a privacy pool, for example, but systems similar to the cash, like uh, supporting internal transactions can be also implemented on Ethereum. So I just want to clarify a little bit. When Roman says internal transaction, he means that, um, for example, if in case of Tornado Cash, let's say if we deposit a transaction into Tornado Cash, and then we can transfer ownership of those funds without exiting the smart contract on chain. So that would be kind of definition of uh, internal transaction. And Zcash has this functionality where I can enter the shielded, I mean, I can make a shielded transaction and then I can transfer the ownership of my uh, Z, Z coins to like somebody else without 
exiting exiting the anonymity pool. Wow, I, this is interesting though to to compare because I too had never really thought about Zcash in that context, but. Yeah, I mean, if we take a, a step back to like the the original question of what what's a mixer, and and you said there's cust custodial and non custodial ones. I have mostly thought about custodial ones and and interacted with them in the past, where it's basically kind of like a mining pool UI, where you transfer your coins to some entity, they kind of keep it for a while, and then they transfer it back after you know sending it around a bunch of transactions, doing whatever they do. That's a very easy model to think about and to explain because like this person takes a bunch of money in, shuffles it around in a bag and sends it all out again. Like it's, it's a pretty easy model. Uh, the non-custodial ones, uh, yeah, that's interesting because I never lose ownership and Zcash, I guess, fits that model where you know I, I, I never lose ownership of my thing, but I can transfer it you know, under the veil of a zero knowledge proof. Yeah, that's correct. And uh, basically, custodial mixer could be considered any crypto exchange that doesn't require KYC. Yeah. Also, if you are talking about uh, Bitcoin mixers, for example, they work very differently. They are like tumblers uh, in the sense that they don't really hide the transaction graph, but they try to entangle it, like make a lot of transactions and make the work of analysts harder, but they don't really like perfectly hide the transaction graph like Zcash does or like Tornado does, for example. And that's that was actually a question that I had about mixers. So mixers, the point of them, it's to basically hide where tokens have been. It's to uh, sort of make private the owners, like it's basically to obfuscate the transaction paths. But I guess the question I've, I have is like, how effective have mixers actually been? Like CoinJoin, the one you mentioned on Bitcoin, does that work? They, they could be quite effective if a user uh, follows some rules for coin control and uh doesn't like uh, intentionally or unintentionally mess up the post mixing process because there are some rules that you have to follow like when you use uh privacy solutions like this mm. for example like if i use like tornado cash and you're making multiple deposits and you withdraw all these deposits at the same time to the same address you're already exposing that you you are the one who made those let's say three four deposits and you are withdrawing to the same address. That's why solutions like Wasabi Wallet they are doing a really good job on differentiating between your private private uh, like your private bitcoins and your non private bitcoins where you can label each address with let's say like you know that this address is known and most of the public can identify you because you have transact transacted these coins with, let's say, some crypto exchange that have a QIC on your profile. And then you can have some other addresses where you can label that you have gone through a coin join process and you can safely assume that those coins are not associated with your public addresses. But if you, let's say, make a transaction between those two addresses, then you're already exposing yourself and your identity. Okay, so we've mentioned a couple of these uh, setups, but what other mixers have come before you guys? Like what what are common mixers and how do they work? I can also mention more like privacy technology, Mimble Wimble. It gained a little bit of popularity lately. The idea is that you join all transactions similar to what CoinJoin does, but you do it with all transactions on the blockchain. So entire blockchain is basically a, a single block. <laughs> yeah. Um, huh. And on paper, it looks really good. But when you start to dig in into this, for example, if the observer monitors how this last block uh, state changes with time, he can see the transactions happening. Like if you uh, see the delta between last state and new state, 
you see what changed. So the observer sees not only the last block, but the evolution and can tell something about what transactions are happening there. And there are a few techniques that they utilize to hide what actually happens. For example, dandelion. A dandelion, right? D dandelion, yeah. yeah. It's when transaction not immediately published, but uh, goes through a few nodes first and joins with a few more other transactions and only then is published. But still the observer can sometimes catch these transactions when they not published yet and see this partial state when they are joined only with a few transactions. They will hmm. not really be very private. So there are a couple different attacks that can discover the transaction graph on the Mimble Wimble based chains. Do you, but I mean, again, is that a, I mean, I, I love, I actually really, I, I think it's super interesting to kind of understand these protocols, these like full blockchain protocols as using these techniques that mixers maybe would use. But are there other sort of mixers that live on other chains that you see coming before what you guys are working on? Hey swap, for example, uh, it's based on ring, sig ring signatures. Uh, and uh, ring signature based mixers usually have uh, Mars much worse uh, privacy properties because their anonymity set is much smaller. It's within yeah, a single it's... ring and in practice it's, it, it's usually around like 5 or 10. When, whereas uh, solutions similar to Ternate Cache can have thousands. There's obviously lots of custodial mixers uh, like we talked about. They're they've been around forever and they're easy to build i guess the, there's a shift now in, in moving to non-custodial as cryptography evolves as ethereum gets more crypto primitives available to it as well um, but there has been some interesting attempts although i haven't i can't really say that they've been successful but i've seen you know sort of things sitting a bit in between custodial and non-custodial where it's custodial, but it's a smart contract that holds it. So you can sort of say that, you know, the smart contract has the control and you can verify the code and you're going to get your money back. But then there's no randomness in, in smart contracts. The smart contract can't hold private keys and do crypto on its own. So the, the mixers become kind of dumb and just like it would be easy to, to analyze and trace back what's actually going on. Uh, so. Okay, so I think we've set the we've set the scene in a way of like what has existed before, what what kind of techniques have been used, what are some of the limitations of those techniques with zero knowledge based uh what did you say non-custodial mixers. I do know of one other case you kind of mentioned quickly there, Miximus. So Miximus is also zero knowledge based. It comes from the lab of Barry Whitehat. Um did is tornado cash sort of taken is it miximus plus is it was it started on miximus and then you moved it was is it based on that or is it a completely new construction uh it is uh, almost the exactly same thing but it uses more uh snark friendly hash functions uh, like Pedersen commitment and memes hash uh, and they are much easier to compute on the snark side and on the smart contract side and I, if i'm not mistaken i think miximus has been uh, used with a zoc rates uh, framework to build and uh, uh zocrates, zocrates yeah. Yeah. Snark, Zoc I think. yeah yeah or e even the libsnark which is much more like it's not very user friendly comparing to circumlib that was published by ident3 and the semaphore mixer and tornado cache mixer, they both utilizing the Circon Lib library, which is much more friendlier uh, to build new circuits, which is used in zero knowledge probes. Let's now explain then what what is how does it work for tornado cache? What what is the process? Like where where does it live? I guess it's all built using smart contracts. Correct. Uh, so basically, okay. it's the process of building a mixer is similar to build any other uh, decentralized application on Ethereum network. You have your set of smart contracts that you would design in a special way that you would later deploy. 
And uh, one of the, I think, key components is to uh, compile so-called like verifier smart contracts. So verifier smart contract would have some uh, um, would, would have some functions to verify your uh, zero knowledge proofs. And you, in order to generate the proof for that, you, you would have to have some uh, keys on the client side. For example, in our case, in Tornado Cash, uh, when you go to tornado.cache website, you download 16 megabyte keys that would be used to generate a zero knowledge proofs in order to submit this proof to the smart contract. That's the process on the smart contract side. And the rest of it is just basically front end code with con which consists of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to interact with a smart contract. Do you use anything? You mentioned Zocrates before, which has this tool to generate smart contracts to do verification. Do you use anything like that to generate the smart contracts or are they all like handwritten? Uh, no, they're not all handwritten. Uh, we use framework called Circumlib that allows you to write a, a circuit in, a, in their own uh, pr programming language, I would say. It's, uh, that's what Roman Semyonov has been working on uh, when he joined Tornado Cash team. Yeah, and to answer question about smart contracts, uh, the Circom has a similar function that allows you to generate verifier contract. So you do a setup, generate smart parameters, and the result of this process is prover and verifier keys, and the verifier key gets embedded into verifier smart contract. And if you're curious how we what what has been deployed onto mainnet and how to deploy or play around in your local environment, feel free to go to our GitHub repository where everything is published there. How does, uh, this is actually a question I have about like deploying a mixer on top of Ethereum. Would you, um, like, is it the, like, is, is it Tornado Cash that has deployed a smart contract and then anyone can use it? Or is it that you'd actually be deploying a smart contract yourself when you're actually participating in Tornado Cash? So right now you don't really need to deploy anything in order to use Tornado Cash because the, those contracts have already, uh, they already been deployed. But okay. if, if you want to learn about how it's been built and to play around in your local environment, you can definitely do so just by downloading our uh, GitHub code and understanding how it works. So in, in a presentation, I did a presentation this summer with Howard Wu, and he actually explained Miximus to me mm -hmm. and, and to the audience in a pretty simple way. The way that he described it was like, you, as a user, you have the prover key, and then you use a zero knowledge proof to prove that you have the prover key without actually revealing what that is. Um, prover key is usually the term used for snark keys. So it is the snark Prover key is, is a term used for snark parameters that are used to generate a proof. But okay. also you have your like private information describing your deposit in Tornado Cash, we call this a node. So when you go to smart contract, you generate some secret and post uh, your money and the hash of this secret to the smart contract. And then when you want to withdraw under your new identity, you generate a proof that you know a pre-image to some hash that smart contracts knows. And also there are nullifiers similar to Zcash nullifiers. So based on your node, you also generate a hash of nullifier and send it along to the contract with withdrawal request. And each node has a unique hash that you post during the deposit and unique nullifier and the hash and nullifier are connected. So when you post a nullifier to the smart contract, it checks that it didn't see it before, so that this node was not spent. I see. So in when you deploy the smart contract at the beginning, does it have sort of a set of these nullifiers? No, no. You generate the 
unique nullifier and initially contract doesn't have any deposit any deposits and doesn't have any nullifiers so you make a deposit and it the smart contracts add the hash of your deposit to its list and when you make mm -hmm. a withdrawal it also adds the hash of your nullifier to this list I see. And when you're doing a withdrawal, it just checks the list that it doesn't contain your nullifier already. That's what uh, pre prevents from double spending. Double spend. Yeah, this yeah. is actually, so the episode we did with Zuko, he actually explained that model in Zcash quite extensively. And so that's that's helpful. That's kind of what you're doing, but in smart contract format. And how how does this get written? Like, does somebody... They deposit it, they must also have to pay gas. Yes, so uh, the deposit you can do from any web free enabled wallet uh, by and uh, any like D app browser. So it's just a regular transaction that you would do like on any other D app. Uh, and but before the deposit, you generate something on a client side called node. This node is your actual deposit later on that you can uh, that you would have to use later on when you want to withdraw from a Tornado Cash. So that's very important to keep it somewhere or to make a backup uh, in your whatever preferred way to store your private keys it, you should consider this not as a as a private key basically i see okay yeah yeah and then when you want to withdraw you would provide this note to a front-end interface and then you would select where would you like to withdraw this uh note to like to which address and it's highly recommended yet you read some rules that you should not reuse the addresses. You would most likely need to generate a completely fresh address without any transaction history in it. And then when you click withdraw, it would start generating the proofs that would later on be, will be submitted to a smart contract. And that proof will, um, would have, uh, those, properties like recipient uh, there are like private and public inputs that are that are generated inside of that proof that you would submit to a smart contract how is the proof generated technically like is is it a javascript library to generate that how long does it take to generate uh, we, we use a web assembly a library called websnark uh, it is part of uh, circom uh, system uh, and uh, our proofs take around like 10 seconds to prove, 8 to 10 seconds. Not too bad. Uh, and uh, also we have uh, this uh, relayer system. As for example, when you generate a new Ethereum address for your withdrawal, it doesn't have any ether to pay for gas, and you somehow need to submit this transaction for Ethereum. And you cannot directly fund this address from your old wallets because it will connect old wallets yeah. to the new wallet on the blockchain. So we use Relayer. Um, so basically, you uh, instead of submitting the transaction with the proof, you give this proof da data to a Relayer that submits the Ethereum transaction for you and gets compensated for the gas he just spent. And uh, yeah. the Relayer cannot uh, alter any data inside the proof including your withdrawal address and fee that you are willing to pay for Relayer because if any data is altered, the proof will be, will be invalid. So the Relayer network is completely trustless and anyone can spin up their own Relayer by going to our GitHub and taking a look how to do that. That, that Relayer is actually solving a problem that was highlighted in the past, I think around Miximus, which is that because of these gas fees, you could actually do some sort of tracing. So there's like all this crazy magic happening in this mixer only to be ruined by this little gas fee that happens to match up to the address that you're to kind of taking it out of. So this is some part of your construction that's been created to make sure that that, like that gas reveal doesn't happen. But is the relayer something that is very common? Is this like a very standard piece of software that is like just 
a lot of people are using or is this something that you guys build? Uh, to answer your question, like if somebody else used the Rewares network, I think the answer is yes. Uh, for example, uh, Wasabi Wallet, they have uh, something called Coordinator, which is very similar concept to Rewares. And uh, when we were trying to, we didn't want to actually build our own Rewares system because we wanted to use something more generic that that would so that it would be more decentralized. Uh, and we tried using something called Gas Station Network by Open Zeppelin. Unfortunately, we hit some technical limitations of that current implementation, and I think they will solve these issues in the next release. So that's why we we just had to build our own like custom made uh, solution uh, that would define our like rewire protocol and how how does the rewire behaves and what kind of uh, endpoints it should have. Uh, Gas station network is basically um, it's a concept uh, made by I think Open Zeppelin and there is some other company. Yeah, Tabuki, yeah, thank you. Uh, basically, what they're trying to solve is that to make this network for any de uh, decentralized application so that any DApp developer that c wants to uh, build some application, they, they can use some endpoints from gas station networks so that users don't even have to have a MetaMask or any web free enabled wallet to interact with a smart contract so that everything will be paid out by this uh, gas station network for gas fees. So it sounds like gas station was originally created really just uh, as, a, as a means to help people get involved, like to be able to use web three products. Yeah. Like just to, to help reduce friction. Basically. Exactly. Yes. Uh, yeah. Because as we know, the user experience is something that we all struggle in a crypto space. Like how do you build an application that would be very similar to a web 2.0 experience? And yeah. that's, I think that's the vision for gas station network. Got it. But you guys have created your own. Um, do, does it, does it also reduce friction or is it, st is it actually still, you have to be pretty sophisticated in order to use it. I wouldn't say so that you have to be sophisticated. Yes, I I want to believe, yes, it reduces the friction. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so as you've sort of indicated in various ways, like it, it does take some effort to use this correctly. And I think the simplest example is if there was only one user of Tornado Cash, then it wouldn't be private. Right, like that's the very concept of a mixer and why it's called a mixer, because it's mixing a bunch of people's stuff. Um, if it's just one person depositing and then, you know, 10 minutes later, one person exiting out of it, then yeah, it's pretty obvious what's going on. We might be <laughs> yeah. able to figure out who that is. Um, <laughs> so what is the correct way to use Tornado Cash? Uh, to continue this example of one user, for example, if we see the situation where a lot of user users used the Tornado Cash before, but there was some uh, period of inactivity, for example, and then one user came along and did a deposit and immediately someone else did the withdrawal, there is very high chance that it is the same user, right? Uh, the similar, like, there are a lot of correlations and statistical analysis that can be done. For example, if someone deposited, did uh, 10 deposits, and uh, then immediately someone did uh, 10 withdrawals to the single address, there is also a high chance that it is the same person. So we always recommend to wait some time before between deposit and uh, withdrawal and uh, also wait until there will be a few deposits, like uh, a few other people that came along and did the deposit between your deposit and withdrawal. There are also a lot of uh, network level concerns. Tornado Cash uh, solves only on-chain part of privacy, but you also need to take care of your or of hiding your IP address, for example. Uh, so what can happen is maybe your internet service provider, he knows your IP address and he can 
log all the websites you connect to. And for example, he can see that you sent some packets to a tornado relayer. Uh, it's the connection itself is HTTPS encrypted, but he sees that you sent some packets to tornado relayer, and then he immediately sees that someone did a withdrawal on the Ethereum network. So then in this case, your internet service provider can tell that probably it was you. Also, mm. the dApps, if you didn't clear cookies and use the same cookie with the old address and new address, in this case, the app can tell that it is the same person. Um, also, in Fura node, uh, to interact with Ethereum, you use some kind of Ethereum node. And if this is in Fura, and it usually has API key, uh, for example, MetaMask, it will usually use the same API key for every wallet. And if you use your old address and new address in the same MetaMask instance, the Infura will, can be able to see that those addresses are connected. But for regular users, it's important to know that you don't need to be like hardcore paranoid. Maybe you can do some trade-offs uh, for convenience. For example, you can be okay that Infura probably in theory can know that your addresses are connected, but most likely they don't bother. I think the idea here is like, it's also like, would the average viewer be able to understand what's happened? Like, can I figure out what has happened to somebody's tokens? Or would you need to like have an investigation go in and like talk to all the service providers and the, and the node providers? Like, I think this is maybe what you're talking about. Like, if some overarching power wanted to know, they could, but the average viewer can't see what you're doing. Yeah, usually we try to analyze like worst case scenarios as much as possible, but probably for average user, it doesn't need to be on this level. Yeah, it's sort of a difference between is a, is a crazy ex trying to figure out what you're spending money on, or is it the government trying to arrest you? <laughs> Yeah. Um, they're kind of different attack vectors. Right. So this at DevCon this year, we actually did a panel on mixers with Ro Roman. You were on that panel. Um, and I asked a very unpopular question about regulators and the legality of all of this. The entire room just like groaned. <laughs> but I still think it's very important. And I, like, I don't think it's something that one should groan about. I think you should probably you know, think about it. So what, what is your thoughts on that? Like, are mixers, are mixers okay? Are mixers, are they legal? So I can quote uh, from a documentation website from Wasabi Wallet. Uh, they, ha they actually have this question that, like, what's the legal status of Wasabi Wallet? And I think it can be also applied to Tornado Cash. And it says in USA on like May 9th, 2019, the FinCEN issued guidance that stated that uh, anonymizing software provider is not a money transmitter and the FinCEN regulations uh, re exempt from the definition of money transmitter. Those persons providing the delivery, communication or network access services used by a money transmitter to support money transmission services. Basically, if it's a non-custodian solution and you do not collect any extra information, that should not be considered as a money transmitter. And on more general level, private doesn't need to mean illegal. Like, I don't want to leak my private information. I, I'm not like hiding something. Mm -hmm. And uh, for regulators, it is already known scenario because we have cash that has similar properties, that it's kind of anonymous, and regulators already know how to deal with this. They have mechanisms in place uh, to make sure that people that uh, interact with cash pay taxes and uh, things like this. And the same mechanisms can be applied to private currencies and mixers. Yeah, I wonder, I mean, so let's let's use an example that I think really lives in the crypto world, but like say there was an unmate, like a hack of an exchange or something, and a bunch of funds were taken, um, they, they were run through mixers. Like, 
if the mixer is really, really effective, doesn't it make it almost impossible to track down that hacker and like get those funds back? Or is there still some trace outside of the mixer that you, you can imagine? So I, I would say it could be effective if the people who, uh, who use it know how to use it like and follow the rules. And for anyone else, it would not be possible to, to see that uh, and also to prevent uh, that kind of usage. Um, what, if, what if amounts were really, really big, though? Like, is that viewable? Like in a mixer scenario, like say this huge deposit happens into the smart contract and then this huge, like, like it, does the value that's being mixed matter? Yes, it might. Like, I will just answer that uh, right now on Tornado Cash, there are like four uh, type of uh, amounts that you can deposit using Ethereum currency. It's a 0 0.1, 1, 10, and 100. So you would not be able to deposit more than that. I see. Uh, but yeah, you can do a multiple deposits, but then uh, like it depends on liquidity of Tornado Cash. Uh, so you can mix the similar amounts that other people are mixing. You cannot mix like a lot. Mm. And also in situation when someone steals a lot of money, it's uh, in like in real world, it, it is the same situation as someone stole a bunch of cash. And how law enforcement works in these cases, they usually find that someone starts buying yachts and property for money he is not supposed to have, and then they confiscate the computer and hardware and find evidence there. So like, this is how law enforcement finds similar thefts in cash. So I guess there will be the same situation. Yeah, I think law well, well enforcement already knows how to handle those situations. Yeah, I think when talking about regulation and maybe part of why it gets a groan is that it's so undefined and like it usually just devolves into like, is it moral to provide privacy services kind of thing? Whereas like there are, there are certain angles, like, is it a money transmitter? That's a very clear question and should have a clear answer and that we should know about when we go build these things. Um, but then it, it's always surprising to me when I talk to like particularly Bitcoin people, but crypto people in general who think that like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna like send my money through Zcash and then the government can never find me spending the money. It's like, well, no, that's not really how it works. Like <laughs> if, if you can't, you know, say where the money comes from, they're still going to like tax you or put you in jail or something. Like it's not just, oh, it showed up out of nowhere. And I just spent it and like, you can't prove otherwise. No, but they don't have to, the, the burden of proof is on you. Um, so like in, in that regard, I don't think it matters at all. Like it's it, like everyone has said, it's just like cash and it's no difference. And, uh, and, and just to final point to regulation question, uh, I think Zcash did an enormous job to explain New York, uh, regulators about Zcash and about its privacy features that would enabled Gemini uh, uh, crypto exchange to list Zcash cryptocurrency. And it's still like compliant with all the uh, re regulations. Mm. Well, I mean, I, I think that on the front of like, I've, I actually, I feel like this has been repeated many times, but this idea that like, if you want businesses or even just ind individuals to really, really work with crypto, then you definitely need to provide some way for them to protect their privacy. Like nobody wants all of their salary published at all times, all of their activity, you know, viewable by everybody. And businesses especially like cannot function if everything is transparent, actually, at least not in the way that they're built up right now. And so I think having this kind of privacy is very, very important for sure. It's strange, though, because it's almost like the complete privacy is the part where actually governments or tax you know, enforcers, they would no longer be able to track it. I think this is where we get into these questions of like, how private do we need things? People are being people. They will still... I don't know. Uh, even after they like have this private money, they would need to spend it somewhere. And that's when they 
how they get exposed and they will make mistakes. That's why it will never be, I think, a possibility for like complete privacy of all the money. Yeah, I think your definition of complete privacy here is no more private than cash, right? Or you still have you still have endpoints that interact with the real world. Correct. And for for businesses, uh, most of privacy solutions like Zcash, Tornado, Aztec, they provide an ability to uh, give a special key to taxman to allow him to view the cash flow. So the regulator can see actual transaction data, but you hide it from your competitors. Yeah. And the Zcash has this viewing key, and I think it's a, it's one of those things that they don't have to put in. There's no real kind of reason that they should put that in. Like the government isn't forcing them to put that in. They're doing it as a sort of preemptive, like we know this is a good feature to have. Some people will want it. Um, you can use it or not. In, in Tornado, nodes can be used in the same way as a keys. After you do a withdrawal, the node data can be used to link deposits with withdrawals. So if you want someone to uh, be able to see a connection between your deposit and withdrawal, you can provide this node to them and it will serve as a proof. Yeah. <laughs> so this would be like if you want to declare something or if you like if you actually needed to prove it yourself for whatever purposes. Yeah, if you want to yeah. construct the uh, the transaction history of your uh, funds, like well, before you use Tornado and after you use Tornado, and if you want to prove that that you have normal Ether, oh, I don't know how to say it, uh, then you can provide those nodes just to sh to build the whole picture. Why would somebody use Tornado Cash and not use Zcash? Because, oh yeah, that's a, basically we did the research recently by downloading all those privacy solutions and uh, try to using them. With Zcash, I don't know if they hear me, I hope they do. Uh, if you go to your website on zcash.com and you try to find a wallet that has a shielded transaction, for some reason their main wallet is listed at the end, which is not even up to date, and when you download it, you have to synchronize the full chain and download like two gigabyte of keys, which is not user friendly. And so it's, it's not designed for like very easy user experience. And for example, if you, there are some other Zcash wallets which are not listed on Zcash website, I think they will update their information after they hear it. Uh, there is like a ZPO wallet, which is much more user friendly, and uh, there is also Zac wallet Lite. But still, like there is not enough like documentation and explanation on how to actually use this wallet. So I would say there is a very high user friction, and that's why people use Tornado Cash rather than Zcash because we really pay attention on very easy user experience. And I guess you're also living on the Ethereum blockchain. So do you just need to have ETH to use it? That's correct. Yeah, if you already have your assets in Ethereum, it's much easier to use smart contract on Ethereum than trying to use some other chain. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you use Tornado Cash, like swapping Ether to Zcash, uh, uh, if you use Zcash uh, by swapping Ether here and then doing transaction and swapping back to Ether, it is basically the same as using Tornado. You need to take care of all the correlations. So you basically use it as a mixer and you need to take all the same precautions. And Got it. In this case, why not just use something that is already built there? Does Tornado Cash also work with other ERC-20s or is it only working with ETH? Yes, we have added uh, ERC-20 uh, token support, but unfortunately people don't really use it. So the anonymity set pools are very low. <laughs> That's one of the problems with the ERC-20 tokens. And uh, yeah, we spent quite a lot of time developing it and it turned out that it's not something that our users use at, uh, at, at this moment. Even DAI. Like even, even DAI. DAI has like... Stablecoin. <laughs> with a deposit of like, I think 10 DAI, 
the, there is like anonymity set of 15 or something and the four larger deposits there there is no one that has made a transaction yet uh, also some uh like many people i think asked for interest on tornado like economic incentives and we added cdi and CUSDT that allow you to earn interest while your funds are still in Tornado anonymity pool. And still nobody is like a lot of people ask about it, but nobody uses it. So th that's one of the lessons that we learned. Uh, if somebody gives you like a cool idea, you should not just jump, like, jump and implement it because it might turn out that nobody is going to use it. <laughs> or like the three people who asked you are the only people who are going to use it and it's not enough to create a mixer. Right. Mm -hmm. What happened? So a few months ago, back in October, you published a blog post that was something along the lines of we got hacked and then hacked ourselves or something. So what, what, what happened there? Uh, basically, those, I just want to mention that uh, when that happened, we still haven't got our security audit yet, which we do now. But at that time, we didn't have it, and uh, we we basically we published very minimal version of Tornado Cash with some very uh, hard limits like 0.1 Ether as a deposit, and uh, we found some issue which Roman can further explain. Yeah, it turned out that in underlying library, Circumlib, that we depend on, uh, there was a vulnerability that uh, eventually allowed, uh, if exploited, to drain all the funds from the mixer. So a pretty bad exploit, if if it had been, like, found. Yeah, uh, and thankfully we knew about it before anyone actually exploited it, so we were the first to exploit it and drain all the funds from the mixer, and then we deposited it to a new instance that contained the fix. Got it. And was this, this was, because I feel like Miximus was also affected by this, right? I, I remember when it went around that this was found. Uh, it, it was a different one. In the end of July, we discovered uh, another vulnerability. Uh, I found, uh, I was looking at Tornado Cache code and uh, trying to make sure that everything is okay and found one issue and turned out this issue was present in like almost all the case snark based solutions at this moment on ethereum yeah and um, it was like there was more than i think 10 projects that had pull requests with the bug fix for this issue yeah i think i remember that one so that was a different one that was this this sort of underlying was that also something found in a library yeah it was the way that uh, the verifier contract didn't make a certain check and this was like so obvious issue and i think this is why a lot of people missed it because when you look at it like everyone probably thought that for sure this check should be in the contract and nobody even tried to check hmm. and which, which uh, library a lot of was that people, in? which which library was that a in? different library so a lot of people independently made this oh. exact same mistake in multiple places wow. okay i see what's the name of the library that you found in uh it, it was everywhere it was in zocrates in circom in in libraries that used to generate snark and okay. any solution based on this library was vulnerable. was this this was the july vulnerability you're talking about yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. But then in October, there was one that was more specific to Tornado Cash. It it was in Mims Hash. Okay. It was vulnerability that allowed to fake Mims hashes. Got it. And make a collisions. So this, I mean, this in general brings up the topic of security, and like every project we talk to has to have some sort of, you know, idea around security when it comes to privacy tokens. This the. the the worry or the, the worst case scenario is that everything is private and yet there's a vulnerability that allows either like in the Zcash, that's a Zcash vulnerability where it allows someone to forge tokens uh, secretly and then be able to extract basically value from nothing or that you could actually hack it and drain it, but it would be private and no one would notice until I guess they go to get their tokens. When someone drains it, it's exactly the same process as a Zcash vulnerability. Basically, someone prints the fake oh, note. Oh, I see. Okay. So, so it is... mechanism is exactly the same. Ah. Yeah. And 
in theory, vulnerabilities can could happen in the future, but uh, without actually deploying solutions and uh, trying to use it, nobody will ever like. We need to deploy something in practice in order for it to gain popularity, and maybe some people will look for bugs. And I see what you're saying. So it's, it's this idea that like. We still need to publish something. You need to get something out there. This shouldn't make people worried about publishing because if you don't publish, I mean, things need to come out and then vulnerabilities need to be found. And then I guess the question is, how do you deal with that? And it was interesting how you guys dealt with it. I actually appreciated the the speed and transparency with which you kind of just like, <laughs> you're like, this thing was found or thing was broken and we've you know done what we can to fix it. I think you were lucky too, though, because like, what had what would have happened if it had not been found by you? Well, if if somebody else would found it, they would profit like two thousand yeah. dollars at that time. So I guess this this was something that we would be able to risk and to fund with our own money later to reimburse the users. I, I would say, yeah, we did a security audit, so we hope that it was robust enough to cover the issues. And if there is something else comes up in the future, I guess we'll deal with it. Yeah. And I mean, disaster happens from time to time, like parity multi six and some other stuff. Like it can, it can happen with any project. I think it is part of every project. I, I, I find this an interesting story. Not so much because of the details, but because it's a realistic view into what it takes to build something on Ethereum, I think. Um, like like you say, like you ship something, you find bugs, you scale it up, you do what you can, you do audits, you do whatever else. Um, you know, I think projects should have a sort of a plan of attack if you know, this, this is uh, what we're going to do if there is another hack or when disaster strikes, this is how we will react. It is obviously extremely hard to define that upfront because you don't know what the disaster is, but um, sort of a disaster recovery plan kind of thing. Uh, I know that there are a lot of projects so like MakerDAO spends a bunch of time trying to design various fallback solutions and escape hatches and everything else. and. You know, we haven't really seen if those measures are effective yet or not. And I think this, in general, this whole topic is something that the space has yet to really figure out. The problem with the point for disaster recovery is that if you have one, that means your your application is not decentralized. If you are decentralized, then you cannot have a disaster plan recovery yeah. because you're decentralized. It's all there. It's immutable. That's it. Well, the, the disaster recovery plan could be something decentralized as well, like having a statement in the EIP process that should this thing happen, then we, we as a community will come together and take this action, uh, which would be nice to have. But, you know, for Ethereum is probably not going to happen. <laughs> I know what you're referring to. Uh, yes, uh, I, I agree. It would be great to have some have something like this and some other projects. They choose to use some DAOs that would be able to, let's say, upgrade the smart contract in case of disaster. But right now, I don't think we have any like uh, huge DAOs that would effectively implement the strategy. Uh, and that the community will trust some DAO that they will act in a, you know, in a good manner. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I think it, like, this is something we haven't figured out as a, as a community and as a, as an industry. By the way, there is one more potential solution. There is a decentralized insurance yeah. uh, project, a uh, project that, uh, you can buy insurance from them and in the event that something happens with a smart contract, someone steals the funds, you will get uh, money from the insurance. Yeah, I think that's uh, speaking about DeFi and everything else, like that's something that we've yet to see that I think should exist mm. and like proper insurance companies on chain. All right. So I feel like we've gotten a pretty good picture of Tornado Cash and what 
you're working on and you know we've covered quite a bit of ground but what's next for you guys what do you see happening with tornado cash our current roadmap is that the bigger vision is to uh, replicate all the privacy preserving features from zcash on top of ethereum uh, the next one would be to implement similar to Wasabi wallet, uh, like a Tornado Cash wallet, where you can have the private, private and non-private transactions. And the third one to make a research how you can do internal transactions uh, for Tornado Cash. And keep in mind, uh, we we are a project that we didn't have any VC funding, we didn't have any token offerings, so. Our, our motivation comes from just bringing the privacy for everyone. And uh, if you like what we do, you can check out our Gitcoin grant application to learn more about our roadmap. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. I, w I wanted to add that a current version of Ternata is, it, it was the simplest thing uh, that we could roll out quickly. So further, down the road, uh, we will have a lot of ideas how to make more advanced and better solutions with internal transactions and any amounts inside the privacy pool and tokens and stuff like this. Cool. Well, thanks so much for sharing this topic with us and kind of going into it. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for having us. And to our listeners, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. <laughs>